Committee on Science, Space, and Technology will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recesses of the committee at any time. Good morning and welcome to today's hearing entitled Artificial Intelligence, With Great Power Comes Great Responsibility. I now recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. First, I would like to uh, note that one of our witnesses, uh, Dr. Jaime Carbonell from Carnegie Mellon, Mellon University is unable to be here today due to a medical emergency. We wish him well and a speedy recovery, and without objection, will ensure his written testimony is made part of the hearing record. One of the reasons I've been looking forward to today's hearing is to get a better sense from our witnesses about the nuances of the term artificial intelligence and implications for our society in a future where AI is ubiquitous. Of course, one might say AI is already pervasive. Since the term was first coined in the 1950s, we have made huge advances in the field of artificial narrow intelligence, which has been applied to many familiar everyday items such as the technology underlying Siri and Alexa. Called ANI for short, such systems are designed to conduct specific and usually limited tasks. For example, a machine that excels at playing poker wouldn't be able to parallel park a car. Conversely, AGI, or artificial general intelligence, refers to intelligent behavior across a range of cognitive tasks. If you enjoy science fiction movies, this definition may conjure up scenes from any number of classics, such as Blade Runner, The Matrix, or The Terminator. For many individuals, the term AGI invokes images of robots or machines with human intelligence. As it turns out, we are decades away from realizing such AGI systems. Nevertheless, discussions about AGI in a future in which AGI is commonplace lead to some interesting questions worthy of analysis. For example, Elon Musk has said, has been quoted as saying that AI, quote, is a fundamental risk to the existence of human civilization and poses vastly more risk than North Korea. Does that mean that AGI may evolve to a point one day when we will lose control over machines of our own creation? As far-fetched as that sounds, minds and scientists are certainly discussing such questions. For the short term, however, my constituents are concerned about less existential issues that usually accompany new and evolving technologies. Topics such as cybersecurity, protecting our privacy, and impacts to our nation's economy and to jobs. I am an original co-sponsor of a bill introduced earlier this year titled the AI Jobs Act of 2018 to help our workplace prepare for the ways AI will shape the economy of the future. I will also introduce legislation today to reauthorize the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which includes language directing NIST to support development of artificial intelligence and data science. There is immense potential for AGI to help humans and to help our economy and all of the issues that we're dealing with today. But that potential is also accompanied by some of the concerns that we will discuss today. I look forward to what our panel has to share with us about the bright, as well as the challenging sides of the future with AGI. I now recognize the ranking member of the Research and Technology Subcommittee, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Lipinski, for his opening statement. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Comstock, and thank you, Chairman Weber, for holding this hearing to understand the current state of artificial intelligence uh, technology. Because of the rapid development of computational power, the capacity of AI to perform new and more complicated tasks is quickly advancing. Depending on who you ask, AI is the stuff of dreams or nightmares. I believe it is definitely the former, and I strongly fear that it could also be the latter. The science fiction fantasy worlds depicted on Hollywood big and small screens alike capture imaginations about what the world might be like if humans and highly intelligent robots shared the earth. Today's hearing is an opportunity to begin to understand the real issues in AI and to begin to move forward with informed science-based policymaking. This is a hearing that we may remember years from now hopefully as a bright beginning of a new era. 
Current AI technologies touch a broad scope of industries and sectors, including manufacturing, transportation, energy, healthcare, and many others. As we will hear from the witnesses today, artificial intelligence can be classified as artificial general intelligence or artificial narrow intelligence. From my understanding, it is applications of the latter, such as machine learning, that are underlying technologies that support some of the services and devices widely used by Americans today. These include virtual assistants, such as Siri and Alexa, translation services, such as Google Translate, and autonomous vehicle technologies. As the capabilities of AI improve, it will undoubtedly become a more essential part of our lives and our economy. While technology developers and industry look forward to making great strides in AI, I want to make sure my colleagues and I in Congress are asking the tough questions and carefully considering the most crucial roles that the federal government may have in shaping the future of AI. Federal investments in AI research are longstanding, and we must consider the appropriate balance and scope of federal involvement as we begin to better understand the various roles AI will play in our society. We are not starting from scratch and thinking about the appropriate role of the federal government in this arena. In 2016, the White House issued the National Artificial Intelligence Research and Development Strategic Plan that outlined seven priorities for federally funded AI research. These included making long-term investments in AI, developing effective methods for human AI collaboration, and addressing the ethical, legal, and societal implications of AI. Additional issues to address are safety and security, public data sets, standards, and workforce needs. Earlier this year, the Government Accountability Office issued a technology assessment report led by one of our witnesses, Dr. Pearsons, titled Artificial Intelligence, Emerging Opportunities, Challenges, and Implications. While noting significant potential for AI to improve many industries, including finance, transportation, and cybersecurity. The report also noted areas where re research is still needed, including how to optimally regulate AI, how to ensure the availability and use of high quality data, understanding AI's effects on employment and education, and the development of computational ethics to guide the decisions made by software. These are all critical issues, but more and more I hear concern and widely varying predictions about AI's impact on jobs. AI has the potential to make some job functions safer and more efficient, but it also may replace others. We need to ask, what are the long-term projections for the job market as AI grows? In this context, we also need to ask, how well do our AI capabilities compare to those of other countries? What education, skills, and retraining will the workforce of the future need? These are very important questions as we think about ensuring a skilled workforce for the future that will help solidify U.S. leadership in AI as other countries vie for dominance in the field. If AI threatens some careers, it likely creates many others. We need to consider what Congress should do to shape this impact and make sure Americans are ready for it and make sure the benefits of AI, AI are distributed widely. One other obvious issue of major concern when it comes to AI is ethics. There are many places where this becomes relevant. Currently, we need to grapple with issues regarding the data that are being used to educate machines. Biased data will lead to biased results from seemingly objective machines. A little further down the line are many difficult questions being raised in science fiction about a world of humans and intelligent robots. These are questions we'll likely be called on to deal with in Congress, and we need to be ready. I want to thank all of our witnesses for being here today, and I look forward to your testimony. I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Lipinski, and I now recognize the chairman of the Energy Subcommittee, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Weber, for his opening statement. Madam Chair, can I defer to the chairman of the full committee for his statement? Yes, you may. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Didn't know you were going to do that. Uh, Madam Chair, often unknown to us, advances in artificial intelligence, or AI, touch many aspects of our lives. 
In the area of cybersecurity, AI reduces our reaction times to security threats. In the field of agriculture, AI monitors soil moisture and targets crop watering. And in the transportation lane, AI steers self-driving cars and manages intelligent traffic systems. Multiple technical disciplines, including quantum computing science, converge to form AI. Tomorrow, the Science Committee will mark up the National Quantum Initiative Act, which establishes a federal program to accelerate quantum research and development. This is a bipartisan bill that Ranking Member Eddie Bernice Johnson and I and others will introduce today. My hope is that every member of the committee will sponsor it, or at least a majority. Transforming our current quantum research into real-world applications will create scientific and technological discoveries, especially in the field of artificial intelligence. These discoveries will stimulate economic growth and improve our global competitiveness, important considerations in light of China's advances in artificial intelligence and quantum computing. By some accounts, China is investing $7 billion in AI through 2030 and $10 billion in quantum research. The European Union has also issued a preliminary plan outlining a $24 billion public-private investment in AI between 2018 and 2020. And Russian President Putin has noted that, quote, the leader in AI will rule the world, end quote. No doubt that's appealing to him. Yet the Department of Defense's unclassified investment in AI was only $600 million in 2016, while federal spending on quantum totals only about $250 million a year. The committee will mark up a second piece of legislation to reauthorize the National Institute of Standards and Technology. The bill directs NIST to continue supporting the development of artificial intelligence and data science, including the development of machine learning and other artificial intelligence applications. It is simply vital to our nation's future that we accelerate our quantum computing and artificial intelligence efforts. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and yield back. Thank you, and I now recognize, let's see where we are, the ranking member of the Energy Subcommittee, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Vesey, for an opening statement. I uh, want to thank you, Chairwoman Comstock and uh, Chairman Weber for holding this hearing today, and thank you for all of the witnesses for providing uh, expertise on this topic. I'm looking forward to hearing what everyone has to say today. America, of course, is a country of innovation, and in the digital world of today, more and more industries are relying on advanced technologies and connectivity to overcome new challenges. Artificial intelligence and big data are impacting every facet of production and commerce. AI has the ability to mi mimic cognitive functions such as problem solving and learning, making it a critical resource as we encounter never before seen problems. Uh, those in the energy sector have already seen improvements in productivity and efficiency and can expect to see even more advancement uh, in the coming years. Uh, AI can be used to process and analyze data in previously unexplored ways. Uh, technologies such as sensor-equipped aircraft engines, locomotive, gas, and wind turbines are now able to track production efficiency and wear and tear on vital machinery. AI could also significantly improve our ability to detect failures before they occur and prevent disasters, saving money, time, and lives. Uh, and through the use of analytics, sensors, and operational data, AI can be used to manage, maintain, and optimize systems ranging from energy storage components to power plants uh, to the electric grid. Uh, as digital technologies revolutionize the energy sector, we must ensure safe and responsible execution of these processes. AI systems can learn and adapt through continuous modeling of interaction and data feedback. Production must be put in place to guarantee the integrity of these mechanisms as they evaluate mass quantities of machine and user data. Uh, with Americans' right to privacy under threat, security of these connected systems is of the utmost importance. Uh, nevertheless, I'm excited to learn about the valuable benefits that AI may be able to provide for our economy uh, and our well-being alike, uh, with a Gartner research study reporting that AI will generate 2.3 million jobs by 2020. Uh, that's a lot of jobs. Uh, the growth AI will bring not only to the energy sector, but to healthcare, transportation, education, and so many others uh, will help ensure the prosperity uh, of our nation. I look forward to 
seeing what light our witnesses can shed on these topics and what we can do in Congress to help enable the development and deployment of these promising technologies. Uh, Madam Chairwoman, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, and I now recognize Mr. Weber for his opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, today we will hear from a panel of experts on next generation artificial intelligence, AI, as we've all heard it described. And while some have raised concerns about the negative consequences of AI, this technology has the potential to solve fundamental science and improve uh, fundamental science problems and improve everyday life. In fact, it's likely that everyone in this room benefits from artificial intelligence. For example, users of voice assistance, online purchase uh, prediction, fraud detection that the gentleman from Texas mentioned, and music recommendation services are already utilizing aspects of this technology in their day-to-day -day life. In the past few years, the use of AI technology has rapidly expanded due to the increase in the volume of data worldwide and to the proliferation of advanced computing hardware that allows for the par powerful parallel processing of this data. The field of AI has broadened to include other advanced computing disciplines such as machine learning, we've heard about neural networks, deep learning computer vision, and natural language processing, just to name a few. These learning techniques are key to the development of AI technologies and can be used to explore complex relationships and produce previously unseen results on unprecedented timescales. The Department of Energy, DOE, is the nation's largest federal supporter of basic research in the physical science, sciences with expertise in big data science, high performance computing, advanced algorithms, and data analytics, and is uniquely positioned to enable fundamental research in AI and machine learning. DOE's Office of Science Advanced <coughs> Scientific Computing Research Program, or OSCAR as we call it, program develops next generation supercomputing systems that can achieve the computational power needed for this type of critical research. This includes the department's newest and most powerful supercomputer called Summit, which just yesterday, just yesterday, was ranked as the fastest computing system in the entire world. AI also has broad applications in the DO mission space. In material science, AI helps researchers speed the experimental process and discover new compounds faster than ever before. In high energy physics, AI finds patterns in atomic and particle collisions previously unseen by scientists. In fusion energy research, AI modeling predicts plasma behavior that will assist in building tokamak reactors, making the best of our investments in space. Even in fossil fuel energy production, AI systems will optimize efficiency and predict needed maintenance at power generating facilities. AI technology has the potential to improve computational science methods for any big data problem, any big data problem. And with the next generation of supercomputers, the exascale computing systems that DOE is expected to field by 2021, American researchers utilizing AI technology will be able to track even the bigger challenges. We cannot afford to fall behind in this compelling area of research, and big investments in AI by China and Europe already threaten U.S. dominance in this field. With the immense potential for AI technology to answer fundamental scientific challenges, it's quite clear we should prioritize this research. We should maintain, I will add, American competitive edge and American exceptionalism. This will help us to do that. I want to thank our accomplished panel of uh, witnesses for their testimony today, and I look forward to hearing what role Congress can play and should play in advancing this critical area of discovery science. And Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you, and I will now introduce today's witnesses. Our first witness today is Dr. Tim Persons, Chief Scientist at the U.S. Government Accountability Office. He also serves as the Director for GAO's Center for Science, Technology, and Engineering. Dr. Persons received a Bachelor of Science in Physics from James Madison University and a Master of Science in Nuclear Physics from Emory University. He also earned a Master of Science in Computer Science and PhD 
and biomedical engineering, both from Wake Forest University. Uh, next, we have Do Mr. Greg Brockman, our second witness, uh, who is co-founder and chief technology officer of OpenAI, a nonprofit artificial intelligence research company. Mr. Brockman is an investor in over 30 startups and a board member of the Stellar Digital Currency System. He was previously the CTO of Stripe, a payments startup now valued at over $9 billion. And he studied mathematics at Harvard and computer science at MIT. And our final witness is Dr. Fei-Fei Li, Li, chairperson of the board and co-founder of AI for All. In addition, Dr. Li is a professor in the computer science department at Stanford and the director of the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Lab. In 2017, Dr. Lee also joined Google Cloud as chief scientist of AI and machine learning. Dr. Lee received her Bachelor of Arts degree in physics from Princeton and her PhD in electrical engineering from the California Institute of Technology. I now recognize Dr. Persons for five minutes to present his testimony. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman Constock, Chairman Weber, Ranking Members Lipinski and Vizi, and members of the subcommittee. I'm pleased to be here today to discuss GAO's technology assessment on artificial intelligence. To ensure the U.S. remains a leader in AI innovation, special attention will be needed for our education and training systems, regulatory structures, frameworks for privacy and civil liberties, and our understanding of risk management in general. AI holds substantial promise for improving human life, increasing the nation's economic competitiveness, and solving some of society's most pressing challenges. Yet, as a disruptive technology, AI poses risks that could have far-reaching effects on, for example, the future labor force, economic inclusion, and privacy and civil liberties, among others. Today, I'll summarize three key insights arising from our recent work. First, the distinction between narrow versus general AI. Second, the expected impact of AI on jobs, competitiveness, and workforce training and third, the role the federal government can play in research, standards development, new regulatory approaches, and education. Regarding narrow versus general AI, narrow AI refers to applications that are task specific, such as tax preparation software, voice and face recognition systems, and algorithms that classify the content of images. General AI refers to a system exhibiting intelligence on par with or possibly exceeding that of humans. While science fiction has helped general AI capture our collective imaginations for some time, it is unlikely to be fully achieved for decades, if at all. Even so, considerable progress has been made in developing narrow AI applications that outperform humans in specific tasks and are thus invoking crucially important economic policy and research considerations. Regarding jobs competition in the workforce, there is considerable uncertainty about the extent to which jobs will be displaced by AI and how many, how much any losses will be offset by job creation. In the near term, displacement to certain jobs, such as call center or retail workers, may be particularly vulnerable to automation. However, in the long term, demand for skills that are complementary to AI is expected to increase, resulting in greater productivity. To better understand the impact of AI on employment moving forward, several experts underscored the need for new data and methods to enable greater insight into this issue. Regarding the role of the federal government, it will continue its crucial role in research and data sharing, contributions to standards development, regulatory approaches, and education. One important research area the federal government could support is enhancing the explainability of AI which could help establish trust in the behavior of AI systems. The federal government could also incentivize data sharing, including federal data that are subject to limitations for how they can be used, as well as creating frameworks for sharing data to improve the safety and security of AI systems. Such efforts may include supporting standards for explainability, data labeling and safety, including risk assessment, and benchmarking of AI performance against the status quo. It's always risk versus risk. Related to this, new regulatory approaches are needed, including the development of regulatory sandboxes for testing AI products, services, and business models, especially in industries like transportation, financial services, and healthcare. 
GAO's recent report on FinTech found, for example, that regulators use sandboxes to gain insight into key questions, issues, and unexpected risks that may arise out of the emerging technologies. New rules governing intellectual property and data privacy may also be needed to manage the deployment of AI. Finally, education and training will need to be reimagined so workers have the skills needed to work with and alongside emerging AI technologies. For the U.S. to remain competitive globally and effectively manage AI systems, its workers will need a deeper understanding of probability and statistics across most, if not all, academic disciplines. That is, not just the physical, engineering, and biological sciences, as well as competency in ethics, algorithmic auditability, and risk management. In conclusion, the emergence of what some have called the fourth industrial revolution and AI's key role in driving it will require new frameworks for business models and value propositions for the public and private sectors alike. Even if AI technologies were to cease advancing today, no part of society or the economy would be directly or indirectly untouched by its transformative effects. I thank uh, the committee leadership, committees, uh, thanks to uh, the members here for your uh, holding a hearing on this very important uh, topic today for such a time as this. <laughs> Madam Chairwoman, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Members, this concludes my prepared remarks. I would be happy to respond to any questions that you or other members of the subcommittees have at this time. Thank you, and I now recognize Mr. Brockman for five minutes. Uh, Chairwoman Comstock, Chairman Weber, Ranking Member Lipinski, Ranking Member VC, members of both subcommittees, thank you for having me today to deliver testimony. I'm Greg Brockman, co-founder of OpenAI, a San Francisco-based nonprofit with the mission to ensure that artificial general intelligence, which we define as systems, highly autonomous systems that outperform humans at most economically valuable work, benefits all of humanity. Now, I'm here to tell you about the generality of modern AI, why AGI might actually be in reach sooner than commonly expected and what action policymakers can take today. So first, what's OpenAI? Uh, we're a research company with one of the world's most advanced AI research and development teams. Yesterday, we announced major progress towards a milestone that we, Alphabet subsidiary DeepMind, and Facebook have separately been trying to reach, which is solving complex strategy games, which start to capture many aspects of the real world that were just not seen in board games like chess or go. We built a system called OpenAI 5, which learned to devise long-term plans and navigate scenarios far too complex to be programmed in by a human in order to solve a massively popular competitive game called Dota 2. Now in the past, AI-like technology was written by humans in order to solve one specific problem at a time. It was not capable of adapting to solve new problems. Today's AI, it's all based on one core technique, which is the artificial neural network, a single simple idea that as it's run on faster computers is proving to match a surprising amount of human capability. And this was in fact something that was shown in part by my fellow witnesses, Dr. Lee's work in image recognition. And artificial neural networks can be trained to perform speech recognition or computer vision. It just depends on the data that they're shown. Now further along the spectrum of generality is AGI. Rather than being developed for any one use case, AGI would be developed for a wide range of important tasks. And AGI would also be useful for non-commercial applications, including thinking through complex international disputes or city planning. Now people have been talking about AGI for decades. And so how should we think about the timeline? Well, all AI systems, they're built on three foundations. That's data, computational power, and algorithms. Next generation AI systems are already starting to rely less on conventional data sets where a human has provided the right answer. For example, one of our recent neural networks learned by reading 7,000 books. We also recently released a study showing that the amount of computation powering the largest AI training runs has been doubling every three and a half months since 2012. That's a total increase of 300,000 times. And we expect this to continue for the next five years using only today's proven hardware technologies and not assuming any breakthroughs like quantum or optical. Now to put that into perspective, that's like if your phone battery, which today lasts for a day, started to last for 800 years, and then five years later started to last for 100 million years. It's this torrent of compute, this, this tsunami of compute, we've never seen anything like this. And so the open question is, will this massive increase in computational power, combined with near-term improvements in algorithmic understanding, be enough to develop AGI? We don't know the answer to this question today, but given the rapid progress that we are seeing, we can't confidently rule it out. And so now, what should we be thinking about today? What, what can policymakers be doing today? And so 
you know, the first thing to recognize is the core danger of AGI is that it has fundamentally the potential to cause rapid change, whether that's through machines pursuing goals that are misspecified by their operator, whether it's through malicious humans subverting deployed systems, or whether it's an economy that grows in an out of control way for its own sake rather than in order to improve human lives. Now we spent two years worth of policy research to create the OpenAI Charter, which in fact is a document I have right here in front of me. Uh, this contains three sections defining our views on safe and responsible AGI development. Um, so that's one is leaving time for safety, and in particular refusing a race to the bottom on safety in order to reach AGI first. The second is to ensure that people at large, rather than any one small group, receive the benefits of this transformative technology. And the third is working together as a community in order to solve safety and policy challenges. Now our prim primary recommendation to policymakers is to start measuring progress in this field. We need to understand how fast the field is moving, what capabilities are likely to arrive when in order to successfully plan for AGI challenges. That moves towards forecasts rather than intuition. Measurement's also a place where international coordination is actually viable, and this is important if we want to spread safety and ethical standards globally. So thank you for your time, and I look forward to questions. Thank you, and we now recognize Dr. Lee. Thank you for the invitation, Congresswomen and Congressmen. My name is Fei Fei Li. I'm here uh, today as the co-founder and chairperson of AI for All, a national nonprofit organization focusing on bringing hands-on experience in AI research to high school students that have been traditionally underrepresented in the field of uh, in the STEM fields, such as girls, people of color, and members of low-income communities. Our program began at Stanford University in 2015. This year, AI for All are expanded across North America to six university campuses. I often like to share with my students that there's nothing artificial about artificial intelligence. It's inspired by people, it's created by people, and most importantly, it has an impact on people. It's a powerful tool we're only just beginning to understand and that's a profound responsibility. I'm here today because the time has come to have an informed public conversation about that responsibility. With proper guidance, AI will make life better. But without it, it stands to widen the wealth divide even further, make te technology even more exclusive, and reinforce biases we've spent generations trying to overcome. This will be an ethical, philosophical, and humanistic challenge, and it will require a diverse community of contributors. It's an approach I call human-centered AI, and so it's made up of three pillars that I believe will help ensure AI plays a positive role in the world. The first is that the next generation of AI technology must reflect more of the qualities that make us human, such as deeper understanding of the context we rely on to make sense of the world. Progress on this front will make AI much better at understanding our needs, but will require a deeper relationship between AI and fields like neuroscience, cognitive science, and the behavior sciences. The second is the emphasis on enhancing and augmenting human skills, not replacing them. Machines are unlikely to replace nurses and doctors, for example, but machine learning assistive technology, uh, diagnosis will help their job tremendously. Similar opportunities to intelligently augment human capabilities abound, from healthcare to education, from manufacturing to agriculture. Finally, AI must be guided by a concern for its impact. We must address challenges of machine biases, security, privacy, as well as at the society level now is the time to prepare for the effect of AI on laws, ethics, and even culture. To put these ideas in practice, governments, academia, and industry will have to work together. This will require better understanding of AI in all three branches of government. AI is simply too important to be owned by private interests alone, and publicly funded research and education can provide a more transparent foundation for its development. Next, 
Academia has a unique opportunity to elevate our understanding and development of this technology. Universities are a perfect environment for studying its effect on our world, as well as supporting cross-disciplinary next-generation AI research. Finally, businesses must develop a better balance between their responsibility to shareholders and their obligations to their users. Commercial AI products have the potential to change the world rapidly, and the time has come to complement this ambition with ethical, socially conscious policies. Human-centered AI means keeping humans at the heart of this technology's development. Unfortunately, lack of diverse representation remains a crisis in AI. Women hold a fraction of high-tech positions, and even fewer at the executive level. And this is even worse for people of color. We have good reasons to worry about bias in our algorithms. A lack of diversity among the people developing these algorithms will be among its primary causes. One of my favorite quotes comes from technology ethicist Shannon Vailer, who says that there is no independent machine values. Machine values are human values. However autonomous our technology becomes, its impact on the world will always be our responsibility. With a human-centered approach, we can make sure it's an impact we'll be proud of. Thank you. Thank you. And I now recognize uh, myself for five minutes of questions. Um, Dr. Lee, uh, there is a generally accepted potential for AI-enabled teaching you know, to a minimum, you know, provide a backup for traditional classroom education. So as AI, te AI technology advances, it seems uh, reasonable to assume that you know, traditional education, vocational training, homeschooling, and even college coursework will need to change and adapt. Could you maybe comment about how education in general and for specific groups and individuals might be transformed by AI and, and how, how we can make that positive and really sort of have more of a democratization of education, particularly higher education in STEM and in science? Thank you for the question. Of course, I feel passionate about education. So I want to address this question in, from two dimensions. One is how could we improve the education of AI and STEM in general to more students and, uh, and, and, and general community. Second is what can AI as a technology do to help education itself? On the first dimension, um, as our work in AI for All, we really believe that it's it's simultaneously a crisis and an uh, important opportunity that we involve more people in the development of AI technology. AI represents, humanity has never created a te technology so similar or trying to resemble who we are. And we need AI to, uh, we need uh, uh, technologists and leaders of tomorrow to represent this technology. So personally, I think we need to democratize AI's education to reach out to more students of color, girls, women of traditionally underrepresented minority. At AI for All, for the past four years, we've um, already created an alumni population of more than 100 students, and through their own community and outreach effort, uh, we have been touching lives of more than 1,400 uh, youth, ranging from middle schoolers to high schoolers in disseminating this AI knowledge, and we need more of that in, in higher education. The second dimension that I want to answer your question is, AI as a technology itself can help improve education itself. In the machine learning community, I'm sure, um, Greg, you also agree with me, that there's an uh, increasing recognition of lifelong, the opportunity for lifelong learning mm -hmm. using um, technology as an assistive um, technology. I have colleagues at Stanford who focuses on research in reinforcement learning and education, how to bring more technological assistance into the teaching and tutorialization of, uh, of education itself. And I think this um, could become a huge tool, as I was saying, to augment human teachers and human educators 
to so that our knowledge can reach to more students and uh, and, and wider community. Excellent, excellent. And um, for our other witnesses, um, could you maybe comment on how academic institutions and industry could work with government on AI? All right. So. Uh, you know, for OpenAI's <clears throat> recommendation, it's really about starting with measurement, right? To really start to understand what's happening in the field. I think it's really about, for example, the study that we did showing the 300,000 times increase. We need more of that. We need to understand where things are going, where we are. I think the government is uniquely positioned to set some of the goalposts as well. Um, and we've been pretty encouraged by seeing some of the work that is happening at GAO and uh, also DIUX has had, had some success with this. Um, so we, we think it's really about starting a low touch way for the dialogue to start happening, uh, because I think right now the dialogue's not happening to the extent that it should. Well, thank you for the question. I, I, I do think that, uh, as the committees have pointed out, this is a uh, whole of society issue. It's going to be government in partnership with uh, the private sector, uh, with academia, uh, to look at things. And so I think there is room for uh, thought about how to learn by doing, uh, creating internships and and ways to uh, try and solve real world problems so that you have a mix of the classroom experience as well as uh, making, building, you'll fail a lot of course with these things, but learning in a safe environment and then being able to grow expertise in that way. Thank you, and Dr. Lee, did you have anything you wanted to add to that also? Or? Okay, well thank you and um, I uh, now will recognize uh, Mr. Lipinski for five minutes. Thank you. This is, uh, this is a fascinating topic, and there's, I want to try to move through some things uh, quickly, but uh, get, uh, get some good answers here. I, it seems to me that um, uh, Mr. Brockman, you have uh, a, a different uh, view of how, of AGI, the, the possibilities of AGI and how quickly it can come than the GAO report. Is there is there a reason for this? Is there something you think that uh, GAO is missing? And if Dr. Pearson could, could respond to that. Uh, so, so I don't know if I can comment directly on, on, the, on the report, just not being familiar enough with, with all, all the details in there, but I can certainly comment on our perspective on AGI and its possibility. Um, and a lot of it really comes down to rather than, you know, I think that there's been a lot of more emotion or uh, intuition based argument. And to, to, to your opening remarks, uh, you know, I think that science based reasoning in order to project what's happening in this field is extremely important. And that's something that we've spent quite a lot of effort on since starting OpenAI almost three years ago. And so looking at the barriers to progress as compute data algorithms, data is something that's changing very rapidly in terms of what data we can use. The computation, the power there is growing at a rate that we've just never seen. Over the course of this decade, we're going to be talking, you know, I think about 10 orders of magnitude. And that's something where if you were to compare that to the typical growth of compute, something like Moore's Law, the, the, uh, over the, the period where we saw 300,000x increase in the past six years, we would have only seen 12x. Right? That's, that's a huge gap and that this is somewhere where we're sort of being projected into the future a lot faster than people realize. Now, it doesn't mean that it's going to happen soon. It means that we can't rule it out. It means that for the next five years, as long as this hardware growth is happening, we're in a fog, and it's hard to make confident projections. And so my, my position is that we can't rule it out. We know that this is, you know, we're talking about a technological revolution on the scale of the agricultural revolution, something that could be so beneficial to everyone in this, in this world. And if we aren't careful in terms of thinking ahead and trying to be prepared, okay. and, and, then we're looking to be uh, and, caught, caught unaware. Thank you. Dr. Pearson, do you have a response on, on that? Sure. I, I think, and, and with all respect for our, our Silicon Valley innovators who are upstarts and challenge the status quo, I think it's great that, that we have the system. The, the, key, the key thing that we're seeing is the uh, convergence of these technologies that was mentioned uh, by my panelists of the uh, exponential power in computing, the ubiquitous nature of data, uh, the sophistication of algorithms are all coming in. Uh, and, but that said, uh, many folks in the community are mildly skeptical about the rate at which general AI may come in this area because uh, for several reasons. One is just the way that uh, we think about the problem now, the, co the super complexity that is uh, manifest in addressing uh, the various challenges or looking at larger data sets and looking at all the facets of them. Uh, it's much easier to say than to do. 
Uh, and again, I think a lot of the, as you pointed out, the driving force here is um, the concern about general AI and, and taking over the world kind of thing. And um, it's just much harder to mimic human intelligence, especially in an environment where intelligence isn't even really defined or understood. And I think, uh, as Dr. Lee pointed out, that a lot of this is really about augmentation. It's something else we heard from our experts. It wasn't a replacement of humans. It was a how can we become better humans, uh, more functional humans, and doing these things. So uh, a lot of it just gets down right. to the Let me the I have a short time, sorry. Right. Thank you. I just want to throw out quickly, the, uh, there have been very different, uh, vastly di uh, different opinions and uh, about the replacement of jobs and the disappearance of jobs and what the impact's going to be. Um, Mr. Brocken, what do, you, what do you think the impact will be? So, so I think that with new technologies in the short term, we always overestimate the degree to which they can, they can make rapid change. Uh, but I think in the long term that, uh, that, that, uh, that they do, I think technology is change and that we've seen with things like the internet, that there's been a lot of job displacement, both creation and, and, uh, and destruction. And I think AI will be, will be no different. I think the question of exactly which jobs and when, I think we don't have enough information yet. And I think that that's where measurement really starts to come in. So we, we view it as, a, as, a, as an open question and a very important one. And, and sir, if I can just say, as a bottom line, uh, the, nobody really knows the impact on this. And uh, of course, our experts were saying to know more, we might need to be able to encourage, let's, for example, our Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, data uh, type agency that uh, out of the federal government to help uh, provide more data or different data or things to help try and answer the question of what is the impact as this technology continues to unfurl. That said, there's also a history of when you, it goes back and attributed to Ned Ludd in uh, the, uh, the era of uh, British industrialization and the concern of destroying the machines for the concern about loss of jobs. And yet, uh, in many times throughout history, it's happened in, in an array of technologies where uh, net jobs actually increased. It just they were more sophisticated jobs. They were toward higher uh, value creation and more productivity. So there is hope. Uh, with this technology as well. If the chair, chairwoman will allow, I want to hear from Dr. Lee. Um, I just want to say that uh, technology inevitably in, throughout human civilization has an impact to change the landscape of jobs. But uh, it's really, really critical, like my fe fellow panelists said, uh, that we need to invest in the research of how to assess this change. It's not a simple picture of replacement, especially when this technology has a much greater potential and power to augment it. I just spent days in the hospital ICU with my mother in the past couple of weeks, and, and, and with my own healthcare and AI research, you recognize that a nurse in a single shift is doing hundreds of different tasks in our ICU unit where they're fighting for life and death for our patients. And these are not a simple question of replacing jobs, but creating better technology to assist them and to, to make their jobs better and make the, the lives better for everyone. And that's what I hope we focus on using this technology. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. That's a wonderful example of really vividly explaining to us how that can be used, because certainly as we're an aging population in this country, that's a challenge we're all facing. And so the quality of life an improvement in each of those employees and nurses being able to do a better job. Thank you for, for um, outlining that. I now uh, recognize Mr. Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dr. Lee, is your mom okay? We, we hope that she is, pray and hope that she is okay. Thank you, I'm here, that means she's better. <laughs> okay, otherwise we were gonna be missing two witnesses. Good. She's watching me right now. <laughs> well, well, good. Hi, you're, Mom, yeah. she's doing a great job. You're doing excellent, she's a proud mom and that's some good medicine in and of itself right Thank there. Thank you. So we're, we're glad for that. Um, Dr. Brockman, you and your statement say that uh, your mission was to actually make sure that artificial intelligence benefited people and was better for the most economically valuable work. 
Do you remember that? Uh, I, I, so it's, it's, our, it's in it's your a, written statement. Yeah, that's right. So, so the def, our definition of what AGI will be, whether created by us or, or anyone else, but just the, the milestone is a system that can outperform humans at economic okay, well, Let me read it to you real quick. I'm Greg Botman, co-founder and nonprofit and development organization. Mission is to ensure that artificial general intelligence, by which we mean highly autonomous systems, that, out, that outperform humans at, quote, most economically valuable work, end quote, benefits all humanity. How would you define most economically valuable work? Uh, so, so I think that, that, that again, and, and first of all, I just, you know, the, uh, the, the question of, you know, AGI is, is something that the whole field has been working towards for, you know, really since the, be the beginning of the field 50 years ago. Um, and so the question of, of how to define it, I think, is something that is not entirely agreed upon, uh, that, that our definition is this. And when we think of it, we think of, uh, you think about things like starting companies or very, very high intellectual work like that. Uh, right. And, you know, also to things like uh, going and cleaning up uh, d disaster sites or things that, that humans would be uh, unable to do very well today. Okay, well, I noticed that in your disagreement that Congressman Lipinski uh, referred to with the aid, the report, and you talk, you call them Silicon Valley upstarts. At least you didn't call them young upstarts. So that that's an advantage. Uh, thank you for doing that. But I, w you're literally looking at a new industry that even though the shift, is, bless you, even though the shift is going to be changing, you're actually creating jobs for another industry. And, and going back to Dr. Lee's example with her mom in the IU talking about how much the nurses do, how do you train for those jobs if it's moving as fast as you think it is? Yeah, and so, you know, one, one thing I think is also very important is that I don't think that we have much ability to change the timeline to this technology. I think that there are a lot of stakeholders, there are a lot of different pieces of the ecosystem, and that what we do is we step back and we look at the trends and we say what's going to be possible when. And so I think that the, the question of how to train, again, that's going to be something we're not the only ones that, that are uh, going to have to help answer that question. Um, but I think that the place to start, it really comes back to measurement, right? If we don't know what's coming, if we can't project well, then we're going to be taken by surprise. And so, you know, I think that there are going to be lots of jobs and already have been created job, jobs that are surprising uh, in terms of, you think about with autonomous vehicles, that we need to label all this data, we need to make sure that these systems are doing what we expect, and that all of that, that there's going to be humans that are going to help make these systems. But we would all agree, I hope, and I'll this question for all three panelists, um, all three witnesses, that the jobs they're going to create uh, are well worth the transformation into uh, all of that technology. Dr. Persons, would you agree with that? I would agree with that. I'll, I'll, let me give you a quick example, if I may. Uh, speaking with a former um, Secretary of Transportation recently, uh, just a simple example of toll booth collectors. Uh, we have now a system where you get the easy pass, you drive through, and you have less of a workforce there that did that could have had an impact at that time for a short period on the number of, or loss of jobs for Tobu collectors, and yet it freed them up and enabled them to perhaps do other things that were needed in okay. large problems. And Mr. Brock, when you were shaking your head, you would agree with that statement. Uh, absolutely. I think that the purpose of technology and improvement sure. is to improve people's lives. So, Dr. Lee, I see you shaking your head, too. Yeah, absolutely. In addition to the example, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, persons provide, I think deeply about the jobs that are currently dangerous and uh, and harmful for humans, from fighting fires to search and rescue to uh, to you know to natural disaster recovery. Not only we shouldn't put humans in harm's way if we can avoid it, but also we don't have enough help in these situations. And there, this is where technology should be of tremendous help. Very quickly, I'm out of time, just yes or no, if we lose dominance in AI, that puts us in a really bad spot in worldwide competitors. Would you agree? Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. And Cheryl, you're back. Thank you. Good question. Um, now I recognize Mr. Vesey for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we have heard about already from your testimony some of the advantages of AI and how it can help uh, humankind, how it can help advance us as a nation and a country. But as you know, there are people also that have concerns about AI. There's been a lot of sort of doomsday-like comparisons about AI and what the future of AI can actually uh, mean. Um, to what extent do you think this 
scenario, this sort of you know worst case scenario that a lot of people have pointed out about uh, AI is actually something that we should be concerned about. Um, and 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 if and if there is a legitimate concern, what can we do to help establish a more ethical, uh, you know, responsible way to develop AI? And and this is for anybody on the panel to answer. So so I think thinking about artificial general intelligence today is a little bit like thinking about the internet in maybe the late fifties. Right. If someone was to describe to you what the internet was going to be, how it would affect the world, and the fact that all these weird things were going to start happening, you're going to have this thing called Uber, which you're going to be able to, you just, you'd be very confused. It'd be very hard to understand what that would look like, and the fact that, oh, we'd forget to put security in there, and then we'd be paying for that for you know, 30 years worth of, of trying to fix things. And now imagine that that whole story, which played out over really the course of the past 60, almost 70 years now, was going to play out on a much more compressed time scale. And so that's the perspective <laughs> that I have when it comes to artificial general intelligence, is the fact that it can cause this rapid change, and that it's already hard for us to cope with the changes the technology brings. And so the question of, is it going to be malicious actors? Is it going to be that the technology itself just wasn't built in a safe way? Or is it just that the deployment, that who owns it, and the values that it's given aren't something that we're all very happy with? All of those, I think, are real risks. And again, that's something that we want to start thinking about today. Thank you, sir. Uh, so I, I agree with that. I, I think the key thing is being clear-eyed about what the risks actually are and not necessarily being driven by the entertaining and yet it's science fiction type narrative sometimes on these things, projecting or, or going to extremes and, and assuming uh, far more than where we actually are in the technology. So it's, there are risks. It's understanding the risks uh, as they are. And it, there are always contextual risks. Risks in automated vehicles are going to be different than risks in this technology in financial services, let's say. Uh, so it's really working, again, symbiotically with the, the community of practice and identifying what are the things there, uh, what are the opportunities, and there's going to be opportunities, and then what uh, undesirable things do we want to focus on and then uh, optimize from there on, on how to deal with them. Thank you. Mr. Brockman, uh, in your testimony, you had referenced a report uh, outline and some malicious actors in this area. Could you sort of uh, elaborate on some of your findings in these areas? That's right. So, so OpenAI was a collaborator on this research report, projecting not necessarily today what people are doing, but looking forward, what are some of the malicious activities that people could use AI for? Um, and uh, uh, so that that report, um, let's see. Uh, I think, I think maybe, maybe the most important things here, you start thinking about uh, things around information, privacy, uh, the uh, uh, question of how do we actually ensure that these systems do what the operator intends despite potential hacking. Uh, you think about uh, autonomous systems that are taking action on behalf of humans uh, that are subverted and uh, whether, again, it's, uh, you know, that this report focuses on, uh, on active action. You think about autonomous vehicles uh, and if a human hacker can go and take control of the fleet of those, some of the bad things that could happen. Uh, and so, you know, I think that, that, uh, that this report should really be viewed as we need to be thinking about these things today before these are a problem because a lot of these systems are going to be deployed in a large scale way. And if you're able to subvert them, then, uh, we, you know, that all of the problems that we've seen to date are going to start having a very different flavor where it's not just privacy anymore, it's also systems that are deployed in the real world that are actually able to, to affect our own well-being. Thank you, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you, and I now recognize, let's see, Mr. Rohrbacher. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chairman. This, um, as in all advances in technology, uh, it can be seen as a, a, the great hope for making things better or the new idea that there might be new dangers involved and, uh, or, that new technologies will help certain peoples but be very damaging to others. And I think that where that fear would be most recognizable is in terms of employment and how in a free society people earn a living. And are we talking about here uh, about the development of technology that will help, um, you know, get the tedious and uh, remedial or, or the, the lower skilled jobs that, that are, uh, are really uh, not really, uh, that can be done, you know, by machine 
or are we talking about uh, a loss of employment by machines that are designed to really perform better than human beings perform uh, in high-level jobs? What are we talking about here? Uh, okay, so I can I still gonna use uh, healthcare as example because I'm familiar with that area of research. So if you look at recent uh, studies by McKinsey and other um, institutions on employment and uh, AI, there is a recognition that um, we need to talk a little more nuanced than just an entire job, but the tasks under each job. Um, the technology has a potential to change the nature of different tasks. Again, for example, take uh, take nurse a job of a nurse as an example. It no matter how rapidly we develop the technology in the most optimistic assessment, it's very hard to imagine that entire profession of nurse nursing would be replaced. Yet. Within the nursing jobs, there are many opportunities that certain tasks can be assisted by AI technology. For example, a simple one that costs a lot of time and effort in nursing jobs is charting. Our nurses in our, again, ICU rooms, our patient rooms, spend a lot of time typing and charting into a system, into a computer, while that's time away from patients and, and other more critical care. So these are the kind of tasks under a bigger job description that we can hope to use technology to assist and, and augment. So, so are we talking about robots here or a box that, that thinks uh, and is able to uh, make decisions for us. What are, what are so, we talking? So AI technology is a um, technology of many different uh, um, aspects. It's not just robot. In this particular case, for example, natural language understanding and speech recognition, mm -hmm. po possibly in the in the form of a voice assistant, would help charting. But maybe delivering of simple tools in a fac on the factory floor will be in the form of a small, simple delivery robot. So there are different uh, forms of, uh, of, of machines. Well, we have, there, there are many dangerous jobs that I could see that we don't, we'd prefer not having human life put at risk exactly. in order to accomplish the goal. And uh, for example, uh, at nuclear power plants, we would, uh, it would be a wondrous thing to have uh, a robotic response to something that could cause great damage to the, the overall community, uh, but would kill somebody if they actually went in to try to solve a problem. And I understand that, and also possibly with communicable diseases where people need to be treated, but you're putting people at great risk for doing that. However, with that said, uh, um, when people are seeking profit in a uh, free and open society, um, I would hate to think that we're putting out of work uh, people with lower skills, and we need the, the dignity of, of, of work and, and, and of earning your own way. Uh, once we know now, what, when you take that away, it really has a major impact, negative impact, on people's lives. So uh, I want to thank you all for giving us a better understanding of what we're facing on this. And um, let's hope that we uh, can develop this technology in a way that helps the widest variety of people and not just perhaps a small group that will um, keep their jobs and keep the money. So thank you very much. Thank you, and I now recognize Ms. Bonamici for five minutes. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you to our witnesses. First, I want to note that our nation has some of the best scientists and researchers and engineers in the world, but without stronger investments in research and development, especially long-term foundational research, we risk falling behind, especially in this uh, uh, important area. I hope the research continues to acknowledge the socioeconomic aspects as well of integrating AI in technologies. Uh, in my home state at the University of Oregon, we have the Urbanism Next Center. They're doing some great work uh, bringing together inter interdisciplinary perspectives, including planning and architecture and engineering and urban design and public administration with uh, public, private, uh, and academic sectors to discuss how leveraging technology will shape the future of our communities. Their research has been talking about emerging technologies like autonomous vehicles. 
um, and the implications for equity, health, um, the economy, and the environment and governance. Um, Dr. Pearson, can you discuss uh, the value of establishing this type of partnership between industry, academia, and the private sector to help especially identify and address some of the consequences uh, intended and unintended of AI as it becomes more prevalent? And I, I do have a couple more questions. Uh, sure, I'll answer quickly. Uh, the short answer is yes, our, our experts and, and what we're seeing is the value in public-private partnerships because, again, uh, it would be a mistake to look at this technology in sort of isolated stovepipes, and it would need to be an integrated uh, approach to things, the federal government having its various roles, but key, uh, like you were mentioning at, at University of Oregon, key academic and research questions. There's many, many things uh, to research and questions to answer. And then, of course, industry, which has an incredible amount of uh, innovation and thinking and, and power to drive things forward. Terrific. Thank you. Dr. Lee, I have a couple questions. You discussed the labor disruption, and I know that's brought up uh, a couple of times, and the need for retraining. We really have sort of a dual skills gap issue here because uh, we want to make sure there are enough people who have the education needed for the AI industries, but we also are talking about the workers, like you mentioned, the, the workers in toll booths who will be displaced. But with the rapid development of technologies and the changes in this field, what knowledge and skills are the most important for a workforce capable of addressing the opportunities and, and the barriers uh, to the development? I, I serve on the Education Workforce Committee, and this is a really important issue, is how do we educate people to be prepared for such rapid, cha rapid changes? So AI is fundamentally a scientific and engineering discipline. And uh, to as an educator, I really believe in uh, more investment in STEM education it's from early age on. We look at, in our experience at AI for All, when we invited these high school students in the age of 14, 15, 16 to, to participate in AI research, their capabilities and, 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 and potentials just, just amazes me. We have high school students who have worked in my lab and winning best paper award at this country's best AI academic conferences. And uh, so, so I believe passionately that STEM education is critical for, for the future, uh, for preparing AI Th uh, Thank you, and, and it, as everyone on this committee knows, I always talk about STEAM because I'm a big believer in educating both halves of the brain and students who have um, arts education tend to be more creative and innovative. Uh, I also, Dr. Lee, um, in your testimony, you talk about how AI engineers need to work with neuroscientists and cognitive scientists to help AI systems develop a more human feel. Now, I know Dr. Carbonell is not here today, but I noted in his testimony, he wrote, AI is the ability to create machines who perform tasks normally associated with human intelligence. I'm sure that was an intentional choice to humanize the, the, the machine, but I wanted to ask you, um, uh, Dr. Lee, about, he's not here to explain, but I have no doubt that was intentional. Uh, in your testimony, you talk about the laws that codify ethics. Um, uh, how, how is this going to be done? Um, can you go into more depth about how would, how would these laws be done? Who would determine what is ethical? Uh, would it be a combination of industry, government, it determ determining standards? Um, how, how, is, how are we going to set the stage for, for an ethical development of AI? Yeah, so, so thank you for the question. I think for a, a technology as impactful as AI is to, to human society, it's critical that we have ethical guidelines. And uh, uh, different institutions from government to academia to, um, to industry uh, will have to participate in this dialogue together and also by themselves. Are they already doing that, though? You said that they'll have to, but where, is somebody convening all of this to make sure that there are? So there are efforts. I'm, I'm sure uh, Greg can add to that. Uh, industries in Silicon Valley were seeing companies starting to roll out AI ethical principles and responsible AI practices in academia. Uh, we see that ethicists and, uh, and social scientists coming together with technologists holding seminars, sy symposiums, classes to discuss the ethical impact of AI. And uh, hopefully government will participate in this and, and, and support and invest in this kind of efforts. Thank you. I see my time has expired. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Oh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. <laughs> I thank the gentlelady. The gentlelady from Arizona is recognized for five minutes. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to thank the uh, testifiers today. Very interesting subject and um, something that kind of spurs the imagination about uh, science fiction shows and those type of things. Um, I do have a question on what countries are the major players in AI and where does the US rank in competition with them? And that's to any panelist or all panelists. Um, so, you know, it, today I think that the U.S. Uh, actually uh, ranks uh, possibly top, top of the list. Um, you know, I think that there are uh, lots of other countries that are investing very heavily. You know, China is investing heavily. Lots of countries in Europe are investing heavily. Uh, that I, uh, you know, DeepMind is a uh, subsidiary of a U.S. company, uh, but located in in, in London. Um, and I think that you know it's very clear that AI is going to be something with global impacts. And I think the more that we can understand what's happening everywhere and figure out how we can coordinate on safety and, and ethics in particular, the better it's going to go. Yes, I thank you for the question. I, I think uh, wherever there's uh, large amounts of computing, uh, large amounts of data, uh, and a strong desire to innovate and 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 continue to develop again in this. Uh, sort of fourth industrial revolution that we're moving on, then you, it drives toward uh, certainly China and then our uh, allies and colleagues in Western Europe and uh, developed worlds. Thank you. And is there, did you want to answer? So, oh, sorry, sorry. If, if I could just uh, add uh, that, you know, the most important thing to continue to lead in the field, it's really about the talent. And right now we're doing a great job of bringing all the talent in. At OpenAI, we have a very wide mix of, of national backgrounds and origins. And I think as long as we can keep that up, that we'll be in very good shape. Thank you, and Mr. Chair, I have uh, one more question. And that is, what steps, I think this has been asked in different ways uh, before, but what steps are we guarding against espionage um, from, let's say, you said China, is involved in this, um, and that, that's basically my question. Espionage, hacking, those type of things. What guidelines are currently taking place, and who's preventing this? Is it the private companies themselves? Is government involved? Thank you. So one, one thing that's very atypical about this field is because it really grew out of an academic uh, a few very small number of academic labs that the over uh, overarching uh, uh, ethos in the field is actually to publish, and so all of the core research and development is actually being shared pretty widely. Um, and so I think that as we're starting to build these more powerful systems, and this is one of the parts of of our charter that we need to start thinking about safety and uh, and uh, keeping you know th thinking about things that should not be shared. And so I think that this is a new muscle that's being built. It's right now kind of up to each company, and I think that, uh, uh, that that's something that, that we're all starting to develop. But I think having a dialogue around what sh what's okay to share and what things are kind of too powerful and, and should be uh, kept private, that's, that's just the dialogue that's starting now. And certainly IP, or intellectual property protection, is, is a critical issue. I think of, uh, of one former director of the National Security Agency mentioned that we're, at the time, it was an unprecedented uh, theft of U.S. intellectual property at that time. Uh, just because of the, it's the blessing and curse of the internet. The blessing is it's open, and the curse is it's open. And so AI is going to, I think, be in that that category in terms of what's being done in terms of cybersecurity. It is something our experts pointed out and said it is an issue. Uh, as this committee well knows, uh, it's easier said than done. And who has jurisdictions in the U.S. federalist system about, uh, particularly with a private company and protection of that, the role of the federal government versus the company itself, in an era where, as I think uh, Mr. Rockman's pointed out, it was sort of the big data era where data are the new oil, uh, yet we want to be open at the same time so that we can innovate. So managing that dialectical tension is going to be a critical issue, and there's no easy answer. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I yield back. Chair, I recognize Ms. Estee for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I want to thank the witnesses for this extremely informative and important conversation that we're having here today. Um, I hail from the state of Connecticut, where we see a lot of innovation at UConn, at Yale, at lots of spinoffs on the sort of narrow AI question. But I think for us, really, the issue is more about that general AI. And, and Mr. Brockman, your discussion of the advances, which makes Moore's Law look puny in comparison, is really where I want to take this conversation. 
um, about Dr. Lee, your, your discussion, which I think is incredibly important, about diversity. We, we saw what happened to Lehman Brothers by not being diverse. I am extremely concerned about what the implications are for teaching a, as it were, if it's garbage in, it's gonna be garbage out. If it's a very narrow set of parameters and thought patterns and life experiences that go into AI, we will get very narrow results out. So first I wanna just talk, get your thoughts on that. And the second is on this broader ethical question. We've looked for many years, I remember back when I was a young lawyer working on bioethical issues, the Hastings Center got created to begin to look at these issues. This committee's been grappling with CRISPR and the implications of CRISPR. I think about this being very similar, that AI has many similar implications for ethical input. So um, if you can opine on both of those questions um, and recognize we've got two, uh, you know, two minutes, three minutes left, um, about both the ethical, whether we need centers to really bring in um, ethicists as well as technologists, and then the importance of diversity on the technology side so that we get the full range of human experience represented as we're exciting, uh, our exciting new entry into this fourth gen uh, revolution. Thank you. Yes, um, in fact, when just now, thank you for asking that question. Just now, when someone is using the term doomsday scenario, to me, I think if we wake up 20 years from now, whatever years, and we see the lack of diversity in our technology and, and leaders and, and, and uh, practitioners, that would be my doomsday <laughs> scenario. So it's so important and critical to have diversity for the following three reasons, like you mentioned. One is sheer jobs that we're talking about. This is a technology that could have potential to create jobs and, 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 and uh, um, improve quality of life, and we need all talents to participate in that. Second is innovation and uh, creativity, like you mentioned in uh, Connecticut and other places. We need that kind of broad talent to add in the, the force of AI development. And the third is really justice and, and, moral, um, uh, and moral values that if we do not have this wide representation of humanity representing the development of this technology, we could have face recognition algorithms that are more accurate in recognizing a male, white male faces. And these are, uh, we could have dangers of um, al uh, biased algorithms making unfair long application decisions. You know, there are many potential pitfalls of a technology that's um, biased and not diverse enough. Which brings us to this um, conversation di dialogue of ethics and ethical AI. Um, it, you're right, um, previous disciplines like nuclear physics, like bio bi biology, have shown us the importance of this. I don't know if there is a single recipe, but I think the need for, for centers, institutions, uh, boards, and government committees are all potential ways to uh, create and open this, this dialogue. And, and again, we're starting to see that, but I think you're totally right. It's critical issues. It's Mr. Um, so I, I agree completely with my uh, fellow witness. Uh, so diversity is, is crucial uh, to success here. Uh, so actually, so we have a program called OpenAI Scholars, uh, where we brought in a number of people from underrepresented uh, backgrounds uh, into the into the field and provide mentorship and uh, that they're working on projects and spinning up. One thing that we found that I think is very encouraging is it's actually very easy to take people who do not have any AI or machine learning background and to make them into uh, extremely productive first-class researchers and engineers very quickly, and th that's you know one benefit of this technology being so new and nascent is that uh, in some ways that, that we're all discovering as we go along too. So becoming an expert, there just isn't that high of a bar. Uh, but so so I think that, that that everyone putting effort in the places where the expertise is, I think it's on them to make sure that they're also bringing in the, the rest the rest of the world. Um, on the ethical front, uh, that's really core to, to, to my organization. That's, that's the reason we exist, that we do think that, you know, for example, when it comes to the benefits of who, who owns this technology, who, who gets, you know, where do the dollars go, we think it belongs to everyone. Um, and so one of the reasons that I'm here is because I think that this shouldn't be a decision that's made just in Silicon Valley. I don't think that the question of the ethics and how this is going to work should be in the, the hands solely of people like me. Um, I think that it's really important to have a dialogue. And again, that's something where, uh, you know, I hope that that will be one of the outcomes of this hearing. Thank you very much.
The gentleman now recognizes Mr. McNerney. Well, I thank the chair uh, for holding this and the ranking member. And I thank the witnesses. I have really very interesting testimony and, and diverse in its own right. Um, one of the things that I think that's important here is uh, with this committee is how, how does the government react to AI? Do we need to create a specific agency? Does that agency report to Congress or to the administration? Uh, those sorts of things I think are very important. Um, Mr. Dr. Brockman, you uh, said I think one of the most important things was that we need a measure of AI progress. Do you have um, a model or uh, some description of what that would look like? Uh, yeah, yes, I do. Thank you for the question. Um, and so first of all, I don't think that we need to create new agencies for this. I think that existing agencies are well set up for this, and I was actually very encouraged to hear that, that people are talking about giving NIST uh, uh, a remit to, to think about these problems. Uh, again, GAO and uh, DIUX are already starting to work on this. For example, DIUX uh, had a satellite, a satellite imagery data set hosted a public competition. The kind of thing that we think would be uh, great for government to do as well is to have standardized environments where academics and uh, private sector can test robotic approaches, uh, setting up competitions towards specific problems that various uh, agencies and departments want to be solved. All of those, I think, can be done without any new agency, and I think that that's something that you can both get benefits directly to the, the relevant agencies, also understand the field, and also start to build ties between private sector and, and public sector. Um, I'm one of the founders of the Grid Innovation Caucus. Uh, what are the most likely areas where we'll see positive benefits to the grid, to electric grid stability and resiliency? Uh, who would be the best answer, Mr. Pearsons? Sure, thank you for the question. Uh, I think one of the ways, uh, GAO has done a, a, a good deal of work on this issue, but it's just uh, protection of the electrical grid uh, in the cybersecurity dimension. So uh, is one of our um, scenarios or profiles that we did in this, in this report, what our experts and what folks were saying, and again, the, at the, at, based on the leadership at, of this committee, and the importance of cyber is that uh, it's a without which nothing. AI is going to be a part of cyber moving forward. And so protection of the grid and the cyber dimension is there. Also, I think, as uh, the chairman mentioned earlier, the word optimization. So how we opt optimize things and how algorithms might be able to compute and find optimums faster and better uh, than humans is an opportunity for uh, grid management and, and uh, production. Thank so you. So AI is also going to be used as a cyber weapon you know, against infrastructures or potentially used as a weapon. Is that right? There, there are concerns now when you look at a, a broad definition of AI and you look at uh, bots now that are attacking networks and doing uh, distributed, what are DDoS or distributed denial of service attacks and things like that, that exists now. Uh, you could Unfortunately, in the black hat assumption, you're going to assume that as uh, AI becomes more sophisticated in the white hat sense, so too, unfortunately, uh, the black hat uh, side of things, the bad guys are going to also become more sophisticated. And so it's going, that's going to be the cat and mouse game, I think, moving forward. Another question for you, Dr. Pearson. Uh, in your testimony, you mentioned that uh, there's considerable uncertainty uh, in the jobs impact of AI. Yes. Uh, what would you do imp to improve that? situation. Our experts were encouraging uh, specific data collected on this. Uh, we, again, we have uh, important federal agencies like BLS, uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, and other that, that work on these issues, what's going on in the labor market, for example. And uh, it may just be a, uh, an update to what we collect, what questions we ask as a government, how we provide that data, uh, which is, of course, very important to uh, our understanding of uh, unemployment metrics and so on. So. Uh, there are economists that have thoughts about this. Uh, that was, we had some input on that. There's no easy answer at this time, but the idea that there is an existing agency doing that sort of thing is there. The key question is how could we ask more or better questions on this particular issue uh, on artificial systems? Thank you. Dr. Lee, you gave three conditions uh, for progress in AI being positive. Uh, do you see any acceptance or, or general wide acceptance of those conditions? Uh, how can we spread the word of that so that the industry is aware of them and the government is aware of them and that they follow those sorts of guidelines? Um, thank you for asking. Um, yeah, I would love to spread the words. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, I think um, 
I do see um, the, the emergence of, of efforts in all three conditions. The first one is about more interdisciplinary approach to AI and ranging from universities to, uh, to industry, we see the recognition of neuroscience, cognitive science uh, to, to, to uh, cross-pollinate with AI research. I, I wanna add, we are all very um, excited by this technology, but as a scientist, I'm very humbled by how nascent the science is. It's only a science of 60 years old compared to mm, traditionally classic science that's making human lives better every day, physics, chemistry, biology. There is a long, long way to go for AI to realize its full potential to help people. So, so that recognition really is important and we need to get more research and cross-disciplinary research into that. Second is the augmenting human. And uh, again, a lot of uh, uh, academic research as well as industry startup efforts are looking at assistive technology from disability to you know helping humans. And the third is what many of us focus on today is the social impact from studying it to having a dialogue to having uh, to working together through different uh, industry and, and government agencies. So all three are the elements of human-centered AI approach, and I see that happening more and more. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Neil Beck. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from New York. Nope. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman that's not from New York, Mr. Palmer. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to know if, if AI can help people who are geography challenged. Yeah. Gentlemen, time has expired. Uh, I, I, I request that that com uh, question and response be removed from the record. Uh, I do have some questions. In my district, we have the National Computer Forensics Institute, which deals with uh, cyber crime. And uh, um, what I'm uh, wondering about is with the emergence of uh, and evolution of, of uh, AI. How does, what are we putting in place because of the potential that that, that, that creates for, for committing crime and for solving crime? Uh, Dr. Persons, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, certainly in one of the areas we did, thank you for the question, one of the areas we did look at in general was just criminal justice. So uh, just the, the, the risks that are there in terms of the social risks, making sure the uh, the scales are balanced ex exactly as they ought to be, that justice is blind and so on, was, was the focus of that. However, in terms of the criminal forensics, AI could be a tool that helps suss out uh, what happened, you know, in a retrospective sense, what happened. Uh, but again, it's an augmentation. It's helping the forensic analysts who would know what things look like. Uh, and uh, the algorithm would need to, in the machine learning sense of things, would need to learn what the risks might be going forward so that you perhaps could identify things more proactively and uh, perhaps in near or at real time. So that's the, the opportunity for this. Again, AI as a tool in cyber was a key message we heard uh, moving forward. Any thoughts on that? Um, so today, you know, we're already starting to see uh, some of the security problems with the methods that, that we're creating. For example, uh, that there's a new uh, class of attack called adversarial examples, where researchers are able to craft a uh, like a, a physical patch that you could print out and put on any object. They'll make a computer vision system think that it's whatever object you want it to be. So you could put that on a stop sign and confuse a self-driving car, for example. So these sorts of ways of subverting these powerful systems is something we're going to have to solve and going to have to work on, just like we've been working on computer security for more conventional systems. And I think that the way to think about if you could successfully build and deploy an AGI, what that would look like in many ways, it's kind of like the internet in terms of being very deeply integrated in people's lives, but also having this increasing amount of autonomy and representation and taking action on people's behalves. And so you'll have kind of this question of how do you make sure, you know, first of all, that's something that could be great for security if these systems are well built and uh, have safety in their core and are, are very hard to subvert, but also if it's possible for people to hack them or to, to cause them to do things that are not aligned with the, the value of the operator, then I think that you can start having very large scale disruption. Um, it also concerns me in the context of, uh, it was announced a couple of weeks ago that, that the United States plans to form a space corps. We know that China has been very aggressive in militarizing space. Um, 
if you, if you have any thoughts on, on that uh, discussion of how uh, artificial intelligence will be used in, in regard to, uh, to space, uh, communication systems uh, that are highly vulnerable uh, already, I th think that there's some additional vu uh, vulnerability that would be created. Any thoughts on that? And, and any one of the three of the panelists? Yeah, yes, sir. I, I, so in terms of the, the risk in space, uh, obviously one of the key concerns for AI is weaponization, uh, and which I think is, is, is part of that, and so much less the space domain or any other one. Uh, and so I know our Defense Department has key leadership thinking on this and working strategically on how do we operate in an environment where we have to assume there's going to be the adversary might not uh, operate in the ethical uh, framework that we do and uh, to defeat that. But there's, there's no uh, simple answer at this time other than our uh, Defense Department is thinking about it and working on it. And uh, he's not here, obviously, to uh, testify. Uh, but in Dr. Carbonall's testimony, he made a statement that we need to produce more AI researchers, especially more U.S. citizen or permanent resident AI researchers. And I think that kind of plays into um, uh, that, that issue of, of, of uh, how do we deal with AI in space. That's one of the reasons why I've been pushing for um, uh, a college program like an ROTC program to recruit people into the Space Corps uh, in these areas, uh, start identifying students when they're maybe even in junior high and, and uh, scholarship them at, and through college to, to get them in, into these positions. Any thoughts on that? I'll just answer quickly and just say I think, uh, as Dr. Lee has I think elegantly pointed out before, this is really an interdisciplinary thing. I think there's going to be a need for uh, sort of the STEM, STEAM specialists that particularly focus on this, but I think any particular vocation is going to be impacted in one way or the other. Just like you could imagine rewinding a couple decades or a few decades, I'll date myself, but when the uh, advent of the personal computer or the PC coming in and how that affected now, we walk into any vocation and someone's using a PC or something like that, and it's not unusual, but at the time you had to learn how to augment yourself or your tasks with that. And well, I think that will be the case. Yeah, if I may, Mr. Chairman, just to um, um, add this, this final thought is that um, we've had to deal with, with uh, some major hacks, federal government systems that, that are hacked. And, and what we're, we're faced with, we're competing with the private sector for the best and brightest in terms of cybersecurity. We're going to find ourselves in the same situation with uh, AI uh, experts, uh, the, the, the truly skilled uh, people. And that's why I'm suggesting that we may need to start thinking about how do we recruit these people and, 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 and get them in, uh, as employees of the federal government. And that's, that was my thoughts on setting up a, uh, an ROTC type program where we recruit people in, we scholarship them, whether it's for cybersecurity or, or for AI. Uh, and with a you know four or five year commitment to work for the federal government, because there's going to be tremendous competition, and the federal government has a very difficult time competing for those type people. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Now the chair recognizes the gentleman from New York. It's okay, we're patient. Um, I thank our respective chairs and ranking members for today's uh, very informative hearing, and welcome and thanks to our uh, witnesses. Uh, I'm proud to represent New York's 20th Congressional District, where our universities are leading the way in artificial intelligence research and education initiatives. Uh, SUNY Polytechnic Institute is currently the home of groundbreaking research developing uh, neuromorphic circuits, which could be used for deep learning, such as pattern recognition, but are also useful for um, AI or machine learning. In addition, the Institute has established an ongoing research program on restive uh, memory devices. Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, RPI, is pushing the boundaries of artificial intelligence in a few different areas. Uh, in the healthcare front, RPI is focusing on improving people's lives and patient outcomes by collaborating with Albany Medical Center to improve the performance of their emergency department by using AI and analytics to reduce the reoccurrence of costly ER visits by patients. And RPI researchers are also collaborating with IBM uh, to use the Watson computing platform to help people with prediabetes uh, avoid developing the disease. In our fight to combat climate change and protect our environment, researchers at RPI in Earth and Environmental Science are working 
with computer science and, math and machine learning uh, researchers to apply cutting edge AI to climate issues. And in the education space, RPI is exploring new ways to use AI to improve teaching as well as new approaches to teaching AI and data science to every student at RPI. Uh, with all that being said, there are tremendous universities across our country that are excelling in AI research and education. And what are some of the keys to helping AI institutions like them to excel? What do we need to do? What would be the most important? Um, that's to any one of our panelists. Um, so that, thank you for asking that question. I think uh, just like we recognize AI really is such a, um, a widespread technology that I think one thing to recognize is that it is still so critical to support basic science research and education in our universities. This technology is far from being done. Of course, the industry is making tremendous investment and, and, uh, um, and effort into AI, but it's a nascent science. It's a nascent technology. We have many unanswered questions, including the socially relevant AI, including AI for good, including AI for education, healthcare, uh, and many other areas. So one of the biggest things I see would be investment into um, the basic science research into our universities and encouraging uh, more students um, thinking in interdisciplinary um, terms, taking courses, you know, they can be STEM students, STEAM students. Uh, AI is not just for engineers and scientists. It could be for students with policy-making mind, for students with law interest, and, and, and so on. So, uh, so I hope to see universi universities participating in this in, in a tremendous way, like many great uh, schools in New York State. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Dr. Persons or Mr. Brockman, either of you? No. Uh, so, so I, I agree with uh, Dr. Lee, but I also point out that uh, <clears throat> I think it is also becoming increasingly hard to truly compete as an academic institution uh, because if you look at what's happening, industry right now is actually doing fundamental research. It's very different from most scientific fields um, and that the salary dis disparity between what you can get at one of these industrial labs versus what you can get in academia, it's, it's very, very large. And there's a second piece, which is in order to do the research, you need access to massive computational resources. And for example, the work that we just did uh, with, with uh, uh, this, this uh, you know, playing convex game breakthrough, uh, that required basically a giant cluster of you know, something around 10,000 machines. And uh, that, that's something where in an academic setting, it's not clear how you can get access to those resources. And so I think for the playing field to still be accessible, I think that there needs to be some story for how people in academic institutions can get access to that. And I think that the, the question of you know, where is the best research going to be done and where are the best people going to be, I think that's something that uh, uh, it's uh, uh, you know, playing out right now, I think, in industry's favor, um, but it's not, necessar not necessarily set in stone. Thank you, Dr. Persons. Please. Yes, sir, thank you for the question. And I would just add to uh, my fellow panelists the fact that uh, our experts had said that real world test beds are important to this. You don't know what you don't know. So not only in addition to adding access to data, but being able to test and, and, and do things. These One thing for sure, and I learned in, in fact from OpenAI that a lot of the times these things come out with surprising uh, results. And so that's the whole reason of creating safe environments to try things out and de-risk those technologies, and that's something that uh, I think is going to be important to to enable that basic research to have an avenue to perhaps uh, move up the technology maturity scale, possibly into the market, and certainly, hopefully, to solve critical, complex, real-world problems. Thank you. Uh, very informative, uh, Mr. Chair. I yield back. Someone now recognizes. Uh, the chair now recognizes Jim from Illinois. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for coming to testify today. You know, I've been interested in artificial intelligence for quite a long time. I'm back in the 1990s, uh, in working in particle physics, we were using neural network classifiers uh, to have a look at um, trying to classify particle physics interactions. And uh, when I couldn't stand it during the government shutdown and not so long ago, I went and downloaded TensorFlow and um, worked through the uh, part of the tutorial on it. And um, you know the algorithms are not so different than what we were using back in the 1990s, uh, but the computing power difference is breathtaking. And I very much resonated with uh, your comments on, on the, the huge increase in dedicated computer power for, um, for deep learning and, and similar. And that is likely to be transformative given the, the recent 
And so that, um, uh, you know, we have to think through that because even with no new brilliant ideas on algorithms, there's going to be a huge leap forward. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for that. That's a, a key observation here. You know, else in Congress, um, I'm the co-chair of the New Democrats Coalition of, on uh, Future of Work Task Force, where we have been uh, trying to think through uh, what this means for uh, the workplace of the future. And um, so I'd like to, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to submit for the record a white paper entitled Closing the Skills and Opportunity Gaps uh, Without Objection. That objection is ordered. Um, thank you. And uh, I will be asking for the record um, if you could have a look at this and see if, uh, you know, how, what sort of coverage you think this document has for the near-term policy responses. Uh, because it's, um, you know, this is coming at us, I think, faster than a lot of uh, people in politics really understand. Mm -hmm. Um, and also, um, I will be asking for the record, I guess you may not have to respond right now, um, where the best sources of information on how quickly this will be coming at us. You know, there are conferences here and there, but you, you attend and your friends attend a lot of them. I'd be interested in where you think you really come together to get the techno experts, the economic experts, you know, the labor economists, people like that, all in the same room. Uh, I think it's, uh, um, it's, it's something we should be putting more effort into. Um, on another tech, I, I've been very involved in Congress in trying to resurrect something called the Office of Technology Assessment. Uh, you know, what the GAO did here is very good, um, which is to bring, we had a conference um, of the experts, and you brought in a good set of experts, and a year later now we are getting a report on this, and you know, you need more bandwidth in Congress than that, just uh, you know, on all technological issues, but this is a perfect example. A year old uh, group of experts on, on AI, you know, is, those are opinions that are, are sort of um, dated a little bit, even a year in the past. Uh, and so the Office of Technology Assessment for decades provided uh, immediate high bandwidth advice to Congress. Um, uh, on, on all sorts of technological issues. And so uh, we are coming closer and closer every year in getting it refunded after it was uh, defunded in, in the 1990s. And so, um, uh, so I, I think, well, uh, to ask you a question here, is there anyone on the panel who thinks that Congress has enough uh, technological capacity as it currently stands to deal with issues like this? So I can you. answer that. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's a, you know it's a, it's a huge problem, um, and it's it's been aggravated by the fact that uh, people have, have decided in their wisdom to cut back on the size and salaries available for congressional staff. Uh, one of my the previous uh, uh, members who uh, talked about here talked about the difficulty the federal government will have in getting uh, real professionals, top of the line professionals in here, um, and uh, you know we're we're seeing members of Congress are willing to do anything but give them the salaries. Uh, that there will be necessary to actually compete for those jobs. Um, uh, let's see, I'm, I am now to, uh, let's see, oh, uh, Mr. Brockman, you had um, your, I would uh, advocate everyone have a look at the reference five, in, which is your uh, malicious use of AI, your reference five in your testimony, uh, which I spent, I stayed up way too late last night reading that, and it is real. Uh, um, along the same lines, uh, members of Congress have access to the classified version of a National Academy of Science study on the implication of, of uh, autonomous drones uh, for, um, and this is something that um, I think uh, you know, has to be understood by the military. We're about to mark up a, uh, a military um, uh, authorization bill, an appropriations bill that is spending way too much money fighting the last war and not enough of fighting the wars of the future. Um, and then finally, um, uh, uh, doc Dr. Lee, um, the, in, in the educational aspects of this, one thing I struggle for, I guess uh, if you look through the bios of people who are the heroes of artificial intelligence, they tend to come from physics, math, uh, places like that. And in theoretical physics or mathematics, a huge fraction of the progress comes from a tiny fraction of people. It's just a historical truth. And I was wondering, is AI like that? Uh, are they, are, you know, are there a small number of heroes that really do most of the work and everyone else sort of fills in the thing? So, um, like I said, um, Dr. Foster, um, AI is a very nascent field. So even though it is, uh, collecting a lot of uh, enthusiasm uh, worldwide so societally 
as a science, it's still very young. And as a young science, it starts from a few people. As a, I was also trained as a physics major, and I think about early days of Newtonian physics. And uh, that was a smallish group of people as well. I mean, it's it would be too much to compare directly, but what I really do want to say is that we might be in the early, even pre-Newtonian days of AI. We are still developing this. So so, um, so the, the, the number of people are still small. Having said that, there are many, many people who have contributed to AI. Their names might not have made it to the news, to the blogs, to the tweets. But these are the names that, uh, as, uh, um, as students and experts of this field, we, we, we remember them. And, and I want to say many of them are members of the underrepresented minority group. There are many women in the first generation of a AI experts. So yeah. Yeah. we when need I was, to hear uh, more from know, them. Two or three clicks down in the, the references uh, cited by your testimony. And you look at the papers there and the author lists, it's pretty clear that our dominance in AI is due to immigrants, mm -hmm. okay? And, and Dr. Lee, I suspect you might not have come to this country under the conditions that are now being proposed by our president. And so I won't, I won't ask you to answer that. <laughs> but, it's, but it's important when we talk about what it is that makes this country dominant in things like AI, it is immigrants, okay? And I'll just leave it at that, and I guess my time is up. Thank the gentlemen. Uh, I thank the witnesses for their testimony and the members for their questions. The record will remain open for two weeks for additional written comments and written questions from members. Hearings adjourned.